questions. Yes? What kind of protein in the eggs? So that's a good question. It really depends on what you can tolerate best, right? Whey protein usually comes up um, in most muscle building, bodybuilding type things as number one. But a lot of people cannot tolerate whey because whey is from dairy, right? So there's a couple things you could do. Number one, if you can tolerate it, make sure you get non-GMO, no hormone, blah, blah, blah whey. Right? There's a couple different companies that are good. One I Juicy is Terra, T-E-R-A, Terra's Way. Um, the other thing is if you can't tolerate that is to try Goat's Way, because just by switching to goat milk, some people can tolerate that instead. Okay? If you can't do the dairies at all, and they make you bloated, crampy, anything that just tells you this is not so great. A vegan protein, which is usually a blend of pea, bean, and rice. You can also find an egg white protein. I think those are fine. Okay. The only one I would say don't do is soy. Right? Avoid the soy. Nobody really needs that. You know, the hemp is okay. The only problem I find with hemp is that it's just not as dense, so you end up putting so many scoops in. I'd like to see you hit 15 to 20 grams of protein in like a shake. If it's whey, one scoop is about 26 grams. It's, it's condensed. It's easy. Um, if it's rice alone, then it's like four or five scoops. If it's hemp alone, and hemp is a good protein. I like it. But sometimes you just add so much that it's gritty, and then people just tell me that they won't do it because they don't like it. So, you know, you probably don't care. Right, because I would say, you know, I, the more people get into being into professional health, professional fitness, your tastes change, right? You've tried all kinds of things, you like feeling good, so you're sort of willing to push the taste meter on some things. Um, I know in my office, I try all kinds of things. So there are a few things that I really wouldn't eat at this point. It's like, well, I don't know, it's gross, but I'll eat anyways, like I know what's in it. Um, like most recently I ate the, um, what was it? The exo bar. Has anybody seen the exo bar? The cricket protein? <laughs> yeah, I thought it would be better. It was not. <laughs> now, everyone's like, oh, how is it? I was like, it sort of tastes like insect. <laughs> you know, soy protein, the problem with soy is that there's a lot of things wrong with it. One, it's very hard to digest. That's where they're there, right? Very, whether it's soy protein, whether it's tofu, whatever it is, soy is very hard to digest. And the other thing is that it contains phytoestrogens, right, which are plant-based estrogens. And they will push us into having too much estrogen. Most people, men and women both, are over-estrogened, okay? Because our fat tissue is not just sitting around quiet as storage. I'm sorry she's so loud. She's watching with me. Um, but our fat is not inert. Our fat tissue is fuel that we're storing, and it makes hormones. Okay, so your fat tissue is busy, it's doing stuff, it's moving stuff, and one of the main things it does is push around and produce some estrogen. So then you start adding soy to that and we just start to go up the level of estrogen. It can mess up menses, it can mess up weight, it can change hormone fluctuations. Um, people that are over estrogen usually have a little bit of a ruddy face, sometimes acne, a little bit puffy looking, and kind of an aggressive personality, men and women both, right? Like when someone gets on the bus and they're all flustered, and everything's always pissing them off, they're looking a little over estrogen. Usually it's like, you should reduce the soy, down that. Um, those are usually the first people who are up in your face about how their diet is. You should do what I do because what I do, and you're like, I don't know about that. It's making you a little intense. Um, but that's what that's will happen. It'll give people a little bit of a functional hormone imbalance, men and women both. Um, when they did studies saying, wow, all these you know, Asian cultures, they do all this soy and they have lower rates of this, that is like one teeny weeny factor of what they do. Right? If we're looking at traditional cultures, they wake up and they eat vegetables and a little bit of fish for breakfast. And is there some soy in there? There is. But they are not sitting around eating chunks of tofu, right? which is ever so American of us. Hey, this teeny weeny thing worked. Let's do it times a billion. <laughs> Right? This little smart car is cute and it parks nice. Let's buy a Suburban, right? So it's just kind of how we do things. We read this little piece of research where soy was good. Let's only eat soy, right? Only. And actually, I know I told this story last year because it was a while ago, but I had a patient come in. Um, he's an endurance athlete. He's a triathlete. He's a marathoner. He's a really, really elite athlete. Um, he came in. He's like, I'm tired. I'm exhausted and blah, blah, blah. And I was doing so great and everything just bottomed out this year. So I ran some testing on him. When he came back, his testosterone levels were in the sub level, right? And he was like 31 at the time. And I was like, oh, this is bad. And all I could think of was like, what would take this guy who was so athletically at the top of his game and bottom him out in about six to 12 months to where these levels are off the chart, falling too low? 
And I was like, all I could think of was really, he's the right age group for testicular cancer. I was like, I don't know, I think this is bad. I think this is really bad. So when we met the next time, I had an oncologist name in my pocket and I was like, all right, we're gonna kind of hash through things one more time and then this is, I think, what we have to get checked out. And as we're talking, I'm like, tell me again, like every little thing you're doing. Well, it turned out he was dating a new girl, who's now his wife. And she was vegan at the time, so he thought, well, he would jump on board and support her. And so he was trying to match every single one of his protein needs, no longer with the mix of what he'd been doing, and now only soy. So he was doing soy milk with soy protein and soy yogurt, and he finally added it up. It was 29 servings of soy every day, minimum. And I was like, okay, I think you're turning into a girl. Yeah. This is what I think is happening. So let's cut the soy and let's just see what happens because in my head I'm thinking in my back pocket is like the, the really bad thing. So let's hope this is what it is. So he's like, oh, that's great news because I don't like it, but you know, I'm just trying to kind of woo her and go along with this plan. But if you tell me I can't do it, I'm out. So he goes back to his old diet. We test him about three months and everything is absolutely normal down the range. Like his testosterone goes up 500 points, right? So it's, you know, things do matter. What you're taking in matters. You are changing your insides by what we take in. You know, that was an extreme case, but obviously he went to the extreme end. So, you know, that's not the only reason you shouldn't do soy, but again, it just, it's not really the quality of food that people think it is. Now, if it's on something, you cook something, you use a little soy sauce, you go to the restaurant, they throw a little edamame in it. It's not the end of the world, but I wouldn't make it your go-to chunk of anything, okay? I prefer you did raw sugar compared to Anything artificial, which should never come in, right? And if you had the choice over refined, sure, it's better, right? What's better? Black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so coffee always comes up, right? Because if you look on the internet and it says, you know, coffee is going to save you, you're never gonna have liver cancer, the next day they're gonna tell you why coffee is going to kill you, right? So because you have to remember, aside from the internet being the internet, coffee's a commodity. Right? So if someone's pushing coffee one day, somebody else has to push something different the next day. So you're going to see some fluctuating stuff just kind of out there. In general, coffee is fine for us and it does provide some benefits. That being organic black coffee. Okay. Not frappuccino, right? Which is not really even, I don't even know if coffee's in there. Um, but that's not what they're talking about, right? So it has to be coffee. The benefits of coffee are going to be when you take in <clears throat> one to two cups, right? relatively black coffee throughout your day. The negative of coffee happens either when we soak it in fakey international delight, I went to Vienna and drank this, no I didn't mix, right? Because they don't serve that in Vienna. Um, or when you do the frappuccino stuff where it doesn't have coffee, it's just 7,000 calories of goo and something else. Um, or you are using coffee to pull yourself through the day. You drink coffee to get out of bed. You drink coffee just to get on the train. You drink coffee just to talk to your boss. You drink coffee just to make it to lunch. You drink coffee so you could just brew another pot of coffee. Right? When people come in and say, well, I have like 20 cups of coffee just because it's the only thing that keeps me going. It's not that coffee's bad. It's that you're telling me how fatigued you are and we have to look at something else because coffee is the crutch pulling you through the day. That, I would say, is where the negatives come in. It's not inherently bad, right? Some people don't respond well to it. I will say, every so often I will have someone say, well, you know what, when I quit coffee, I feel better. Okay. You know, if that happens, that's okay. But I wouldn't say that across the board, coffee is a bad thing. I would say the number one thing to remember is that dairy is not a food group, despite how most of us were raised, right? It used to be a part on the food pyramid. Um, and that's because you can buy a spot on the food pyramid, right? If you own a snail farm and you think escargot should be on the pyramid, if you donate enough money, you can get there, right? <laughs> That's how the pyramid is made. It is not made based on any health parameters. The pyramid, which I know has been you know, taken away and revamped a little bit, but I want you to think of what the pyramid was. The bottom was nine to 12 servings of grain a day, right? That's carbs, which we know will raise your cholesterol, will give you diabetes, will do all these other things for you, right? So that was the bottom. Then as you went up, it was like a little chunk of meat, a little chunk of dairy, right? And then sweets and fats and oils were all clumped together in one chunk at the top. When instead, it turns out that we do phenomenally on protein and fat, and green is what destroys us. Um, but you know, that's how the old pyramid was. It has nothing to do with health as much as it had to do with financially, what was that? So when we're talking dairy, most people don't tolerate it very well. Being lactose intolerant is not a new crazy weird thing, it's the norm. You're supposed to stop digesting dairy around age five and there on up. If you can still take a glass of milk at 20 years old, drink it and feel good, you're the anomaly. 
right? If you can still do that at 30, you're the super anomaly. If you're 80 and you can have a glass of milk, you're a super weirdo, <laughs> right? They're out there, but it's weird. Um, most people will have seismic. Maybe they'll be bloated, maybe they'll have itchy skin, you know, whatever else, who knows. It's more normal to grow out of being able to digest milk. So that said, if you go to, you know, no hormones, best raised cows ever, organic cheeses, a little bit for some people is okay. Right? Some people are still alright, they don't really notice the difference. But if someone comes in and says, I really love cheese, and then they're telling me they've got skin issues, and they've got some other stuff, it's like, eh, ditch the dairy. It's probably not serving you any well. Right? So, that can, that's something that people can sort of do on their own. You can stop dairy on your own, and do absolutely no cow's dairy for three weeks. How do you feel? Right? No different, nothing different whatsoever. Okay, great. Right? For a lot of people, dairy gives them thicker mucus, more congestion. Right? And they'll say, my stomach's always fine, but you know what, when I stop dairy, I can breathe a lot better. I'm not waking up, <clears throat> clearing my throat all the time. Right? That's another person I listen to on the bus, kind of like the estrogen person. That person that clears their throat every four seconds, it's like, you gotta mix the dairy. Right? I'll save you the cash. Stop that. Right? So it makes a lot of, and that's not really an allergy or anything else. It's just it's one of the things, the side effects of dairy. So I would say, look at how you're using it, and if you have something that you want to, you know, feel better about, you could change it. You could change to sheep's milk cheese or goat's milk cheese. Just by changing the animal, a lot of people do a lot better. Cow is definitely the toughest on the human population across the board, right? If we're just talking big, big genetic yeah. pictures. Yogurt falls in that same corner, right? So there, are, I mean, there's nice things to say about yogurt. If you get a Greek organic yogurt, you can have, you know, huge amounts of protein. You can get good probiotics, good bacteria in there. But in the end, if it doesn't treat you well, then I would just skip it and move on to something else. Do you consider eggs No. No. I know that, that confuses a lot of people because it's the dairy case, but the egg is from a chicken and it just isn't dairy. Right. So sugar is problematic on a lot of fronts. We will see sugar light up the brain the same as, um, in like the excitable categories, the same as drug use. Right? It's an overexciter. Um, you also cue yourself to needing more sugar the more sugar that you eat. And every time your sugar level drops, it's your own brain, your own brain saying, oh, you need more sugar. The level has gone down. Right? So the best thing to do is just get it totally out again for three or four weeks and just cut it. Right? You'll probably have a week, like week one, week two, you're going to feel the worst. Right, you'll go through a little detox even, but it will drop the cravings significantly. Right, trying to do other things and fake sugars and artificials just prolongs it because you're still sending the brain kind of a weird message. Okay, so it is a pattern that can be broken, but you have to put some effort into it for sure. Okay, one of the things I do like, I will say this: if you're just going to sort of start something and say, "Well, what do I even start?" Um, who's seen the whole thirty? Have you seen the like? I don't know. It's a food plan, I guess I'd call it. It's called the Whole Thirty. They have a book and they have um, some quick starts. It's really, to me, it looks the same as paleo, but with like a lot of hand holding, which is nice. They do a nice job. You can Google this up. You can put it in your phone, whatever else. The big chunks that are out is any grain is out. All dairy is out. All added sugars is out. I see beans too, which is also paleo. So you can eat loads of vegetables. You can eat fruits. You can eat meats of all sorts. You can eat nuts and seeds. Um, I don't know what I'm missing. Eggs for sure. Vegetarian meaning what? Meaning no meat, no pork. Fish? Eggs? Fish. Eggs? Yes. Um, what do you do for protein now besides eggs? Actually just chicken and turkey. So those are in. It's been much more happy. Like but if I wanted to completely cut it off. Why would you do that? I don't like eating it. lean more into eggs. You'd have to lean more into a variety of proteins coming in then, a mix of nuts and seeds and things like that. Um, is she talking to you? Can you give her a little squeeze? Yeah. Um, lentils are still beans. They'd be out because it's a little legume corner. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to sort of line it up ahead of time. It wouldn't be impossible. And you might have to eat more chicken or turkey during that time. Because the whole 30 is 30 days. It's 30 days of eating like this, right? What it will do for sure for people is cut those cravings, 
right? And I do see people sort of learn better eating habits out of it. They don't have to stick with it 100% all forever and ever, but I will say it kind of, if you're someone that's overindulging in the dairy, you're totally head over heels into the sugar and you can't get out of it. It sort of provides that big giant break. And then when people go back to eating a little bit more of their old habits, they don't go as badly, right? And they're more satisfied by fruit and maybe a little cookie and not the whole box of cookies or they don't go back for one more cookie and one more cookie. So I feel like it gives people better control, like a new starting zone. Um, so if you were going to do that, I would say continue with the chicken and turkey, lean on it while you need it if you did something like a 30-day program, knowing you could sort of make variety on the way back on the other side. Okay? Yeah. What's wrong with beans? They usually come up in these programs because when you break them down, they break down to a phytic acid, and that can be tough on the gut for some people. That can lead to other issues. Um, some people don't break it down very well, and so that leads to malnutrition. They're eating well, but they're actually not absorbing well. Some people, it will make them gassy and bloated forever. They never get used to it. They don't ever break it down well. So I think it's just one of those big things to just take out. Um, some people don't digest it very well, and then instead the side effect is not so much gut distress as much as bodily inflammation. We'll just sort of see random inflammation, and when they cut it out, it gets better. So it's just something to take out that does have an effect. Okay. Not often enough to use it that way, right? So, you know, there's definitely times people will go out and they'll order a burger or a steak and they're like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. I feel like my brain just woke up. I feel so much better. They may have been a little bit low in iron and they, and they feel it, right? They'll eat it and they'll be like, oh, I feel so much better. Um, but not enough to say like, oh, I'm craving oranges. I probably need vitamin C or, oh, I'm craving this. That I don't see. Um, I do a lot of nutrient testing, which nutrient testing has to be a tissue test. So it's still a blood test, like to you, you just donate blood, that's the end of it. But in the lab, they're not looking at the serum, they're actually looking at the white blood cells and that's a tissue test, because that's how we look at nutrients and see what you actually have in store. Okay, and that's where we actually see what do you need and what do we need to supplement and how do we need to follow things up. So, which can be interesting. It's interesting as people come back as. For sure, I will say, I would, people that come in with the worst tests from nutrient panels, um, leading the way, of course, anybody who's had chemo or radiation are things that obviously are heavy meds. We expect that. Um, but the next group down is like the, I just got out of grad school, new job group, right? Because you've been poor for a long time, you've been eating poorly under high stress for an extensive number of years, right? Now you're in your first job, which is just as stressful, not, probably not your favorite place, you still have no money, and now you're paying loans and you're eating just as badly. Those groups come up, it's a disaster, right? It's a disaster. So it happens, yeah. Some, some not. So the SpectraCell is the one that's the micronutrient panel that I run the most often. And they actually, SpectraCell is the company name, they run a ton of different things. The micronutrient panel is just one of them. That one is $190 out of your pocket. Insurance, they send it to insurance, some insurance covers it. Uh, the test is $2,000, but they run this agreement that if you sign off on 190, that's it. So if your insurance denies it, it's okay. You paid 190 and you're out, but the test is really two grand. That one, insurance helps. Stool tests, other tests like that, here or there, a lot of times no. Um, a lot of them were covered even up to about three years ago with the changing tides of insurance and where it is today, just keeps changing. Most of that stuff got tossed. So. You know, people will come in and say, oh, I had a stool test done in the hospital, so I already had that. It's like, no, you didn't. You had the hospital version. The hospital version is we're going to test you for anything that might kill you here and now. Right? Okay, you're not going to die today. Out into the world you go. The stool test that we run in clinics is a functional stool test, actually looking for everything that could be bothering you, all kinds of digestive issues. They're not one and the same. The hospital one's covered by insurance, but that's not what most people need now. Right? So just, it's, it's unfortunate. And I would say that's something to keep in mind. You know, when you want to make a healthy change, a lot of people do need to save a little money and decide how important it is for themselves. If they want a healthy change, they want to pay the gym, they want to go see someone that can help them, they need to stop looking at it like, who's going to pay for this for me because I'm not healthy, right? Those days are over. I think for a while you could get coverage like that. Not anymore. I remember years ago looking at my health insurance plan saying, I don't know why they're making me pay. I keep myself healthy. I don't smoke. I don't do anything that's risky, blah, blah, blah. You know, they should be paying me for not using their plan. You know, thank you so much for never needing us. Instead, what I've learned over the years is that insurance actually makes better money the sicker you are and the more testing you need. 
If you need an MRI every other week and you need 10,000 medications, it sounds like that would be bad, like you're using the system and they would hate you. But round about the way, the way that they get paid, they actually love for you to continue to circle the drain for a very long time. Don't get hit by the bus and die fast, right? get a little bit chronically ill and need us for decades. <laughs> Medications, testing, preventative testing, we want you to have it all because that's how they make money. Right? It's inverted and it's upside down. It's not at all how you think, unfortunately. So always think to yourself, you know, if you want something health-wise, prepare to invest in yourself. Over time it actually becomes cheaper because the healthier you are, the less you need to do, you just maintain. You have to remember too that if you're buying poor meats, right, commercially grade jewel burger, the hormones and the antibiotics and all that yucky stuff that's in there is talking to your cells, right? Food is communication. Food is a chemical conversation with your body. So you're adding more hormones in. That's adding up. One big picture I always look at is if you look at pictures from like 1900 and you look at an area of the city where it's poverty stricken skid row. Right? The kids are emaciated, they're scrawny, yes they're in tattered clothing, blah blah, all the signs of poverty, but they're way too skinny because they're malnourished. You take that same demographic today and they're huge, right? And if you ask them what's going on, they're like, oh, all those kids, they just sit around playing video games and eating too much. Sure, they're probably not getting enough physical exercise, I would, I would agree with that. They're probably living in areas that are not safe to just run outside and go down to the park. So there's that. But the other side is that they're getting the cheap meats and the cheap dairies and the school lunches that are laden with hormones and what you're seeing is a hormone presentation. They are still very underfed, they are mostly very hungry, but oversized in a strange way. Right? The girls and boys have breast tissue by seven or eight years of age, which has no place there in a normal society. A lot of the girls are having their periods by age seven or eight, which is not norm. Right? Two neighborhoods over is still going to be at the average of 12. So it's a huge thing. So cleaning up your meat goes a long way. You know, it does have a lot of benefits to it. Right? It does have a good pH to it, for sure. I will say that apple cider vinegar, for some people, will nix cravings. Right? They'll take a little bit, not a lot. It's strong, it's kind of nasty tasting. Right? Um, you know, they'll take like a tablespoon and dilute it in water and drink that. For some people, it will kind of nip the little sugar craving in the bud, maybe enough to make it to the next smarter choice. Let me try that. Um, I will say I think it does have its benefits, yes. Is it do this one thing and nothing else and change the world? No, it still has to go with a better plan, but it does have its benefits. Yeah, it does. Um, just as good as any coconut oil and anything else. So, yeah. Um, but a lot of times, you know, and sometimes it's by different brand. I know MCT oil gets a lot of big hits in like CrossFit gyms. They do just MCT oil, uh, but it's really coconut oil and that's a good fat, right? It's a good saturated fat for us. We can burn it for fuel, we can't store it. Okay? It's a medium, medium chain triglyceride, that's MCT. The protein shake is great, it's usually a time saver. That's where I would recommend it. If you are going to skip a meal or you're gonna leave your workout and skip eating anything, then the protein shake's probably good for you because it's a time saver. Is it better than food? No, not necessarily. Um, would I want someone to just live on shakes? No, of course not, because food comes with so many more nutrients and a different variety. But for a lot of people, it allows them to, you know, walk out of the gym, shower, grab something, make it to work, and it's that or they skip. And you never want to miss that recovery meal. So for some people, it's important there. Others for breakfast, because otherwise they don't eat all day and they just skip breakfast and keep going. So I think of the protein shake as a really neat time saver versus anything else. Um, I would still make sure it was an organic, unsweetened version. Unsweetened. Yeah, because otherwise it's just, it's really sugary. It doesn't really have a lot of nut in it. You can make your own. Some people will make their own, which will be higher in nutrients for sure and better in fats. Um, for people that like to do it, they find it's not too hard. People don't have time, it's too much time, so it's one of those like, do you want to do it or not? Um, but I wouldn't say it's bad, but I would say just make sure it's not throwing in all kinds of added sugar and sweeteners and all of a sudden it's not as healthy as you thought. Okay? You know, do you need to have a glass of almond milk because you no longer drink dairy? No, just drink water. You know, Trader Joe's I like for a lot of reasons, but one of the things I like is that they have a lot of vegetables pre-cut and washed and ready to go. And I find that that allows things to get used better as well. And same with like butternut squash, right? That's a lot of chopping and peeling, all that kind of stuff. They have some that's like pre-cut and in squares in the bag, you just throw it on the sheet, roll some olive oil on it or some other oil that you like, sprinkle it with salt, send it in, and that's the end of that, right? This, people like to argue about this, right? Because there are, there are not 
a lot of studies showing, aha, this person ate organic you know, broccoli and therefore they have the most amazing health in the entire world. Right? They're having trouble like, really sort of correlating that. So I think you have to sort of stand back and think of the bigger picture. If you have all the options in front of you, usually you know, organic or not is a finance limiting question for people. Right? They're there and they're saying, what can I really afford to buy? If I buy it all organic and go to Whole Foods, I can buy this pepper. Or I can go somewhere else and get a bag of groceries, right? So organic is going to mean that it's coming from better soil, right? All of the chemicals are not going to be soaked into the soil, as well as it will hopefully be a more diverse, more nutrient-dense soil. Either because the field hasn't been stripped, they've used better fertilizers that are more encompassing, so more nutrients are coming a little bit more balanced into that fruit or vegetable, whatever it is that you're buying. Conventional is going to just keep spraying, round up on it, you're going to get that chemical coming in, you're going to spray it with NPK so it will look the color, it will grow the size, but it doesn't have the nutrient panel. Right, so they are different. Now it obviously, it still differs on where you grow it. Broccoli that you grow in Utah is different than you grow in North Carolina, just by soil differences. So there's always varieties, um, and I would say that if you have the option, always buy organic. If price is limiting, just buy the vegetables and fruits and wash them at home, right? Give them a good rinse, you know, soak in one of those little sprays. So you are most likely getting more nutrients when it's coming organic. You are definitely getting fewer chemicals, right? And the Roundup, we're going to see, I've seen it now come into the mainstream. Like, it's been coming through seminars of mine for like the last five to seven years. And now I'm starting to see it in mainstream media because it always takes a little while to sort of like make it to the front. And you're going to start to see where Roundup is just causing, it's just annihilating things. Right? The lesson so far that they've tried to push is we need to use Roundup or glyph glyphosate or how you say the word, um, glyphosate. We need to use this because we feed the world. We're the breadbasket of the world. We're making more crops and therefore we are feeding more people. When instead, that product is not doing that. It actually dries up the land, so you need more water for those crops that are sprayed with that chemical. It's, so it's using up more commodities, it's using up more resources, it's not making more, we're not selling it like we say that, so it's totally, you know, it's a financial lie. But I would say that's probably the gist of it, is that you're getting more nutrients if it's organic and fewer chemicals. But if you can't afford it, then you just buy it and you wash it the best you can because you're still getting so much from produce. I wouldn't say, oh, you're right, eat a Twinkie instead. Right? Well, sure. And then with a peel, you like the banana, you can peel off. The orange rind, you can peel off. So even if those fields were sprayed, you have a way of actually getting rid of most of it, for sure. You know, you'll see like there's those lists of like the dirty dozens, like the berries and stuff. I would agree with that because it's just hard to wash. Um, a friend of mine that's in the wine industry will go on and on on why you should only buy an organic wine because they take grapes in from the field, whether it's organic or regular, and they press them. And they're not rinsed and washed, or they just press it. So whatever was sprayed on that grape is in that wine. And if it's organic, it's at least, you know, a few steps ahead. So, which is a really gross thought, I thought. The other thing to remember about beverages, in terms of like alcoholic beverages, is that they are not, as of yet, required to put what's in them on the label. So most wines and beers and things like that that are not craft beers, that are not organic, they have flavor enhancers, they have coloring agents, they have all kinds of stuff. Right? There's a list of artificials, which is why sometimes you'll have some wine and not have very much and have a terrible hangover. And you're like, man, I had like one glass. Like, why do I feel so bad? And then you'll have a different wine two weeks later and you're like, oh, I have like three glasses and I'm a little tired, but I feel fine. I feel great. Right? Because a lot of it's the chemicals that were in there. So I kind of the difference of saying, you know what, I went out and I had this microbrew or I had Ice House. Right? So is hard to better than If it's top shelf, usually yes. <laughs> If it's, it has to be top shelf, right? Because otherwise it has caramel coloring on all the same garbage that's in there. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, if people are in my office and they say, what should I drink? I'm like, you really need, you need to be a snob. You need to absolutely want the better beers and the better wines and be an, you know, and even someone's like, oh, you're so piggy. Why don't you just drink blah, blah, No. Right? Whatever beer comes in a bucket, no thanks. Right? No thanks. Um, I laugh because a couple of friends and I we were friends from college and we studied abroad for a semester, which is where we learned the trick, right? Because up until then in college, you just drink whatever you, you know, could get depending on how old you were, you know, or whatever else, and you got whatever you could afford, which was always garbage. And then you had horrible hangovers. And then we went to Europe and you're like, oh, if you drink real beer, even if you have too much of it, you're totally fine the next day. Mm -hmm. So we never went back to drinking anything again. And of course in college, I was like, what? 
these guys are snobs. Everyone goes to Europe and comes back a snob, and you're like, yes, because I got rid of the pain. I found out where the pain begins, and I cut it out. So, but you know, it's all chemicals, all garbage, just junk. I would say that works sometimes in some people. Right? On paper, it looks like it should work because you're dipping into the glycogen from the liver the night before and so therefore it should be better. Um, there definitely have been some studies where having people do more fasting workouts can work. But those studies are always done in high level athletes and their lives are so fine tuned that you move a little factor and you can see how it plays out. It's not the rest of us who are also living lives. Right? So does it harm you? Not at all. Some people have to run an empty stomach or they just don't feel well, fine. Um, if you do it once in a while and you feel like it does work for you, fine. If it doesn't work for you, I wouldn't sweat it. You didn't do anything wrong. It just it wasn't in the package. Okay, I've got some cards up here. If you need something or if you need my number, certainly Costa can always direct you my way if you wanted to ask something. Um, but I'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you so much for coming out. Have a good night. Thank you, thank you. And you made it. <laughs>